Our guest today, I think, might be one of the best players that we see the least in Chapel Hill. And, and <laughs> got to change that. And we had never met formally until a few minutes ago, but knowing what I know of Bobby Jones, I'm about to embarrass him. So this is just to give you some context on Bobby Jones, if you're a younger Tar Heel fan. He was All-America at Carolina. Yep. That, that's good. He shot almost 61% from the field in his career at Carolina, which is second best all time. Mm. Then goes on to the NBA, where all he does is become an NBA All-Star four times. Eight-time All-Defensive selection. He was the NBA Sixth Man of the Year. He was an NBA champion. His number is retired by the Philadelphia 76ers. Mm. And he's in the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Other than that, not much accomplished. So, Bobby Jones, I apologize because I know that embarrassed you. But well, okay. I, that is very impressive, and thank you for being with us well, today. thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Catch folks up on what Bobby Jones is doing right now. Well, I live in Charlotte with my wife, uh, 50 years, um, celebrating this, this July. Um, we've got eight grandkids. And, oh, wow. Um, I, I haven't coached in about three years. I, I do talk, coach my little grandson who's eight in, in a court in our backyard. Um, but just really, I, I really spend most of my time either reading or um, playing with my grandkids. And I love it. What do you like to read? Uh, different things. Uh, documentaries, history, World War II uh, things. Um, just uh, I'm a lot about uh, Truman, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, those those kind of books. So, the reason that Bobby Jones is here in Podwell headquarters, but in Chapel Hill in total, is an incredible anniversary this weekend. Adam, it's hard to believe it's been this long. And now, but this happened before either Adam or I were even born when this happened. <laughs> But it is perhaps he appreciates you saying yeah that. yeah sure. no, I know you're happy about it. I mean but right up there with Michael Jordan's jump shot to game winner to win in '82 I think this is Adam right this has got to be the top of Carolina basketball lore yes. right eight point comeback in 17 seconds against Duke in 1974 one of two last second wins uh, against Duke yeah. that year um, what. First of all, can you believe it's been 50 years since that happened? No, I can't believe it. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it seems like uh, three years ago. Yes. Really. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to talk about that game. Now, we're not going to be able to hear it right now, but I actually have the radio call. I'm going to put radio calls from the 8 points to 17 seconds. I also have the radio call of Bobby Jones stealing the inbounds pass and scoring the game winner against Duke in Durham earlier that season, right? That's... I think yeah. that would be like one that we talk about more had it not been an eight point in seventeen second comeback later. In the no, year. you're right. That's that game. That was a highlight of my life. I remember Coach Guthrie's during that the last time out. Coach Smith had told us, you know, stay back on defense. But Coach Guthrie's told me, he said, if they put some air under that pass, you can go for it. So he gave me the freedom to do it, and, and it was. It was a little bit of a lob, and I got it, and I was able to finish it. So that was, uh, yeah, it was one of two times in my athletic career that a coach at the spur of the moment, told me to try to do something. I did one with the Sixers and then that one with Coach Cutheridge. What was the one with the Sixers? Um, Jack McMahon, one of the old-timers from the 50s, was one of our assistant coaches. And uh, into the game, he told me, he said, they're setting the screen at the top of the key. So if you can shoot it and just don't go around the guy, just go from behind and just go full speed, you can get the steal. And I did, got it, laid up, and I pointed to him, say thank you for, <laughs> thanks for the advice. <laughs> Both those plays have to do with defense. Yeah. What what was it about you that made you such a good defender? Some say the best Carolina's ever had. Well, I wasn't that good an offensive player. I guess I had to, <laughs> I had to figure out something to to make my out be out on the court with. But uh, you know, I think uh, growing up in in, in Charlotte, um, we, my dad put a court in our backyard, and it was a dirt court, and it sloped to the to the right, and it washed away half the court. So I could only go to my left, which I'm you know, and I'm, I was right-handed most of the time. So that helped me. But getting to Carolina. Um, that freshman year just taught me so much about help defense, giving you know giving help to the to the man, knowing that you'll get help from the next guy, and you know like I'd said earlier, it, it was a freeing kind of experience where you you don't you know you don't you're not going to get if you, if you get burned it's not your fault because you're trying to help somebody else and so it allowed me to get more steals, take charges, block shots, and and that's what I could do. I was a good jumper. I wasn't that great a shooter. I could hit an open shot, but mid range. You know, I was in my NBA career, I was 0 for 17 from the threes. Mm. So, you know, really sort of out of my range. So That's uh, just a bad game today for some guys. <laughs> that's true, yeah. yeah. There's no conscious out there these days. But uh, it would bother me when I'd miss a shot. and So I would concentrate on taking good shots and, and playing within what Coach Smith wanted us to do. 
How much of defense, and I, we're going to talk eight points in 70 seconds, yeah. but how much of defense in your mind is instinctive and how much is kind of a system of what you're doing? Well, I think it's a, you've got to learn to be instinctive, I think. Hmm. I, when I got to Carolina, I didn't, I didn't know help side defense. I, I didn't know, you know to come across the lane, try to block. I just worried about my own man. And then with, the, with Coach Smith's team defense concept, you know, kind of a spider web kind of stretch and but not break kind of a thing where you help everybody else. Um, that really – that and the, uh, the the defensive stance that he taught us to do hmm. by coming – you know, practice – we would start practice every day in a defensive stance. The first day of practice, it was like for 30 seconds. Second day, is, it goes to the 45, then a minute, then two minutes. Finally, gets up to five minutes, and you're, you're you're in that position, and your legs are burning, and he's walking around saying, "Hey, hey how was your school today? How was your school? <laughs> you got any homework tonight? How's your girlfriend? You know, just things, and, and you, <laughs> sweat's popping out of your head, and you just." Um, but that that was the foundation, uh, learning t- to lower your center of gravity so you can move better and quicker, and uh, it went from there to you know all the drills that we had to do. Either in college or in the pros, who's the toughest player Bobby Jones had to cover and why? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, uh, Bernard King was really hard. Um, Julius Irving was tough. Jordan, I played his last two years. Of my, were my his, his first two years were my last two years. So guarding him was somewhat of a challenge. But, uh, <laughs> you know, really, he hadn't developed the, the, the outside shot a, a lot. So he would drive a lot to the lane, and I could just step across and give that help and just stand there. And he ran over me a couple of times. So, you know, that, that was a, 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 f- a blessing that, that I didn't have to face him for all of my career because he was, he was unbelievable. But, uh, yeah, those, those guys really stand out in my mind. All right. So eight points. 17 seconds, which, by the way, Bob Jones had four of the eight points yeah. in that comeback. I'm sure you've thought about this. I'm sure you've talked yeah. about it a million times. But take us through just how it happened, what happened, just how did the Tar yeah. do this? Well, you know, I, I, I don't remember all of it, but I just I do remember getting fouled and uh, going to the free throw. And that really, you know, for me to make two free throws in a row back then was, was kind of a, a miracle in itself. So, you know. Gosh, might be able to do this. (laughs) That's right. So, you know, we made those and then we pressed and I think we got a steal or something. And, you know, the whole time, during the the whole scenario of all those points, um, we never, I I never thought about winning. I I only thought about doing what Coach Smith had told us to do. And he said, as soon as Bobby makes these free throws, we're going to go into this press and we're going to cut this lane off and go for the steal. And it happened exactly the way that he, you know, told us it would. And it was just incredible. Yeah, what was it about Coach Smith that made him so good in those end of game situations? Well, first, uh, Adam, he, he we practiced those a lot, uh, and so we were comfortable with that. But I think more than anything, he instills a, a calmness about his players. Uh, and, and I remember in those timeouts at, at those last few seconds, he, we come over to the bench and he's smiling. I mean, he's happy, and we're down three or four or six or whatever it is, and. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You know, it's like, okay, you know, we're not thinking about winning the game. We're thinking about what's the next play that's going to develop into, to the next play after that. And, and I think that's, that's what a great coach does. He instills confidence in you. And he, he did in me. I, I know that uh, I, if I had not gone to North Carolina and played for him, I, you, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I know that. But I wouldn't be, uh, have played in the NBA probably very long. What lessons did you learn from him? Maybe even that carry yeah. pass – basketball well be on time <laughs> you, got, you have to be on time with coach smith and i that that carries over to me today i you know it bothers me if, I, if i'm late or if something happens and i so i try to always be there somewhere early and uh, uh that's been that's been one you know be honest he was always an honest you know he asked me one time my, i think it was my freshman year he said he brought me to his office he said bobby are you the kind of guy that needs to be yelled at to be motivated and, you know, I thought about it, and my high school coach was a little bit of a yeller, and I, I said, well, you know, coach, I, I really don't like to be yelled at, you know? Uh, he said, okay. So for those next four years, he did not raise his voice to me one time. Wow. Now, Ed Stahl, who was my teammate, told him, you know, I, I kind of need a kick in the rear end every once in a while. So Coach Smith would yell at him. So he, he figured out, he would just ask and be honest, you know, what, what do you need to be instructed, to be corrected? And um, that's the kind of person that he was. Now, he, he was hard. I mean, he, we, we had a, um, 
I, you know, he always had the printed out of the practice schedule in the locker room. And when you walk in, you know, get ready for practice, whenever it said down at the bottom conditioning, I, I would just start sweating cold sweat. <laughs> I, 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 it was really, it was, those practices were the hardest any, of my life. Uh, Olympics, pros, high school, Carolina basketball practice were really physically demanding. They somehow knew how to push you just to the very extreme of what you could do, and then you're done. And uh, so I, I appreciate that. I remember one year um, <laughs> we we were playing in an intramural softball league, some of the basketball players, and we had a pretty good team. And uh, <laughs> I bet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, Don Johnson, I don't know if you Don Johnson was the name back in the day, and he, he was a, a year ahead of me, and he, he actually bounced one off Carmichael uh, from, the out, from the home plate, which is a long way out on that that field where it is now but um the playoffs we, we made it to the playoffs in the softball and the playoffs happened to start you know it, it intersected with the basketball practice the start of basketball practice <laughs> and so we were getting ready to play you know we we're going to practice but we we're also going to do the game and coach smith found out about it and he he brought us into his office and it was just very calm and he, he goes apparently i'm not giving you guys enough exercise <laughs> and, and, I almost fainted. I said, we're never going to play softball again. You know, we, we're, our season's over. We can't wait for you to get on that court. So, yeah, that was – that was uh, he, he knew what to, what to tell you. In 1974, there was no sports center. There was no Twitter. Yeah. How soon after this incredible comeback did you realize how impactful this was to people who both were there and who claimed to be there? <laughs> Well, yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me that I, I heard about, I was there, I, I walked out, I tried to get back in, those kind of things. Um, it was impactful to me just because it was my last home game, as, mm -hmm. you know, being there four years, and, you know, it meant a lot to me. Uh, and Duke was not that great a team. They were a mediocre team who played really well those two games that we played against them. And so um, for us to win that game, you know, going into the ACC tournament was, was huge for us. So do, do you remember – you're feeling anything when Walter Davis knocks in that shot. Yeah, I remember him. I remember where I, where I was. I was on the opposite side of the basket, and I was I, I was getting ready to forearm a guy to get the because I thought it was going to hit the backboard and come mm -hmm. over to maybe to my side. And when it banked in, it was just like, "Are you kidding?" <laughs> you know, it was like, "Well, we're going to win this game," you know. So um, I don't know if you know this or not, but after that game, after that um, regulation, Coach Guthrie's left. He he was um, he left to go interview for the Kansas State job. Right. And uh, Coach Coach Smith said, "Well, you know, you're going to miss your flight if you stay here for overtime." So he he, <laughs> he wasn't there, and he left, and uh, we ended up winning, and, and he and he turned down the job. I think he wanted to stay in North Carolina, which was a blessing for all of us. I kn I, yeah. I knew that Coach Guthridge had talked to Ken. I had, have you ever heard that? No. <laughs> Imagine today if an assistant coach just, just walks out after Sean a May play just like leaves that. After, after regulation. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I got it somewhere to be. I'll see everybody yeah. later. I yeah. saw Coach Guthridge in the parking lot when I was trying to get back into yeah. Carmichael. I guess he gave up too. <laughs> Maybe so. Um, uh, you mentioned the 72 Olympics. Yeah. I've never been able to talk to someone who was on the 72 Olympic yeah. team. What are your memories of especially the the way those Olympics ended? Well, Adam, the, the first thing I remember is I wasn't invited to the tryouts. And I was in the hospital. for I was in summer school, and I, I drunk. I played some volleyball with some of my teammates. It was in the summer, early summertime, and I, I had a seizure. Uh, and they didn't know what it was at the time. Later, they diagnosed it as epilepsy. But when I was in the hospital, Coach Smith came up to me and he said, hey, listen, Bobby, they've invited 150 players to the Olympic trials at the Air Force Academy, and you're not one of them. I said, okay, well, I figured that. I'm not, I didn't get any word. But he said, but a, guy, a couple of guys have dropped out, and I can get you an invitation if you want to go out. And I think it'll, it'll help your career and give you some good experience. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I dropped my class in summer school, and I went out there, and I got, I, I got placed ahead 15 teams with 10 players, and I was on the team with Bobby Knight and defense. And the head coach was Henry Iba. He loved defense. And that's about all I could do at the time. So, you know, it just it sort of rolled into where I ended up starting every game in the Olympics and not having started at North Carolina. Um, got to the gold medal game. I, didn't, I started the game. I didn't play very much. Played the first five minutes, I think. But just remembering it all, you know, it was a um, – 
it, it just it was disappointing. I'll say that it, it was uh, you know, to have to have won twice. You know, we won the, the game with Doug Collins' free throws, but then they threw a pass. It, it, you know, we deflected. It, clock ran out. Uh, they said no. They tried to call a timeout. They didn't get it. Then they threw another one, knocked it away at half court. And they said, no, there wasn't a full three seconds on the clock. Then the final one, they, two of our guys hit each other and fell down, and the guy caught a three-quarter court pass and laid it in. And um, You know, I, I, I was certainly disappointed with that. I, I felt like it was uh, very politically motivated. But that being said, if I had it over again, I'd do it again. Uh, just representing your country is just, just a great honor. And uh, – I loved it. And then, uh, funny, I got to – Coach Smith invited me the next year, 76, the next time you had the Olympics. Four Carolina guys were on the team, and he they invited me up to watch the gold medal game, which I did. And it was just a blessing to see them uh, d- take it. You were obviously very young at that yeah. point in time. I mean, did you – at that moment in time, could you even wrap your head around kind of the, the implications of what was happening? No, I really didn't. I, I, you know, you, at that time, again, North Carolina basketball was, was number one for me. So school had already started. So I, I missed the first two weeks of school. And, uh, th- you know, that put me behind the, the eight ball in one of my classes. So I, that, I ended up having to drop that class and take it summer school my senior year. But – you know, I was. I think all of us. We were the youngest limit team they had ever had, and we were anxious to get back to our to our schools because we, you know, we wanted to do well for for our colleges too. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was, it was, it was a long and drawn out. You know, it's kind of like an espionage thing. We, when we got to Munich, we didn't practice at the Olympic Village. We we had to drive half an hour to the CIA gymnasium, wow. so nobody could scout us, you know, or whatever. And so it was like. You know, really, is it that? <laughs> you know, and then, and, you know, it's just crazy. And then the Jewish uh, incident with all yep. the terrorists and all that, and that's what happened right next door to us. And it was like, why are we still playing? You know, with this tragedy going on, let's 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 see what's really important. So, uh, it was good to be back to Chapel Hill. So, were you in the dorm compound the night that yeah. occurred? Yeah. What what happened then? Well, we the, the compound is, was three rows of buildings parallel to each other, and we were in the middle building. And on the uh, Christ across from us was, was the, the outside building where the Israelis were, and we heard the gunshots. We thought it was firecrackers, and uh, you know we we were awakened early the next morning by our coaches and said, "Listen, you know, there's a bad situation going on here. These terrorists have come in. They've killed some uh, hostages, uh, and they're they're holding these other hostages." And so the only way you could get in and out of the village was there was an underground bus and a car system. So it, it literally took us about 35 to 40 minutes just to get out of the village to go practice because of all the security now uh, with that. And when we came back that afternoon, they were, we, could, we, could actually, we were actually standing out over on this pavilion and, and watched the terrorists marching the Israelis onto a bus to go to the airport. And it was like, if they had wanted to shoot a couple of hundred athletes, they could certainly could have done it right then. Um, we're, you know, you're, you're young, you don't think about those kind of things. But it was like, and then, you know, an hour later you hear that they've all been killed. And it was like, you know, surely the Olympics will stop, you know. But it, you know, it really was, it was my first um, awareness of how big business, you know, the Olympic sport movement is. So, you know, uh, you accept it and you move on. I mean, what you were twenty yeah, years old? Yeah, mm-hmm. I can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah, it was just uh, kind of surreal. Yeah, and and actually, one of my teammates, Tommy Burleson, had snuck out of the Olympic Village the night that night, and was trying to get back in early the next morning. And that's and and they put, held him at gunpoint. Oh, the, the, the security people did right. and said, "Don't turn your don't turn your back." And he had a, they had a they had a rifle in his back, and he. He, I think he has some PTSD from that experience because all the terrorists walked, they let them go by the, him, um, you know, to get out. But it was, and, he, and then because of that, he didn't play the last game. And it probably would have helped us sure. at 7 4 under the basket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These are incredible yes. stories. <laughs> I mean, um, so then you go to the NBA, you have success in multiple places, but mm-hmm. I think people think of you as a Philadelphia 76er. Yeah. What was it about Bobby Jones and Philadelphia that were such a good fit? Well, you know, I, Adam, it starts back with, with Denver. Larry Brown was a Carolina guy. 
Uh, and that's really why I chose to go to Denver. Uh, and then I got traded to Philadelphia, where Billy Cunningham, another Carolina guy, is the coach. And they they believed in the same kind of system. And and for me, it's, it was just like at North Carolina. They recognized what I could do and what I couldn't do. And and th- what I couldn't do was score a lot of points every night. But they had people who took care of that. Dr. J <laughs> was one of them, uh, Maurice Cheeks, Moses Malone, later on Charles Barkley. So, you know, I was I was around players that allowed me to – like if, if Julius would, would beat his man on the layup – I, I, I would just I would get back on defense so his man wouldn't cut out and get a, an easy basket on the other end so I could cover for for those guys, and so it was a perfect fit for me um, as far as the the personnel on the team and they needed a guy that that didn't need to handle the ball and I couldn't handle the ball very well <laughs> I barely ever dribbled but um, you know and they wanted other, I could make my uh, presence felt on the, on the other end and and that's what I did. Julius Irving, all time. Player, yeah, what yeah. what was special about him from somebody who was yeah. close by? Uh, great guy, great teammate, kind of like my teammates at Carolina. You know, you know, back in the day uh, at, at at Carmichael, they used to have a little. The door we used to go out into the court with was like five feet tall, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you had to everybody had to duck. But right above the door was a little plaque that says "United We Stand, Divided We Fall," and so everybody was encouraging with that. And Julius was the same way. Julius was the kind of guy that. You know, at the end of a game, if I, I try to make the, the last second pass and I, I throw it out of bounds, game's over, you go and sit down in the locker, he comes over, sits beside you, hey, say, hey, don't worry about it, we'll get him next time. And I compare that to other guys in the league who, if you make a bad pass to them or you don't give them the ball when they want it, they'll curse you out. They'll, you know, they'll just get all over you. And, um, you know, I asked, I asked, there was another superstar in the league, I'm not going to mention his name, but I asked a guy, uh, I said, what's it like playing with this guy? And he said, it's terrible. We hate this guy. <laughs> you know, you know we're, we're getting paid so we're playing, but, you know, we, it's no fun to play with a guy who's always on you and thinks he's better than you. Julius was better than us, but he, he brought himself down to our level, you know, emotionally and, and, and understand, you know, understood that we, we weren't going to perform as he did every night. How did you see the business of the NBA change during your career? Well, it, it got more big time, of course. You know, back in, again, I started in the old ABA, and that was, you know, three, three nights, three games and three nights and travel, you know, terrible travel and all that. It got better, you know, as we, we moved on into the 80s. And uh, by the time I was retiring, um, you know, th- I'll take the All-Star game, for, for example. I mean, there, you played to win those games because the winners, I think, got $2,500 and the losers got 1000 and they paid in cash right after the game. <laughs> and so, you know, if a guy's making 80000 back then, you know, that, that's important to him. And so everybody was – it was a real game. And, uh, but then, you know, now the, 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 I think the money is, is, is so much in, uh, improved for these guys that it's, it's made them aware of, of hurting themselves. So any little injury, guys aren't playing much. Uh, and, and guys just don't play that many games, you know, because of that. But it, it's 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 changed as far as athleticism. The guys are much more athletic now than back in my day. Uh, much much better shooters. The range is incredible. Um, but I I enjoyed the time that I played, the era that I played in, because you could set screens, you could run plays, and you, you know you could do things. And it, it was, you know, you could you could take a shot and give a shot to somebody and not get thrown out of the game. So mm-hmm. you know it was just a little bit more physical. At least the way it's been romanticized a little bit and the way that like people that, that kind of how I remember it is that the NBA was starting to change, though, I, right when you were right near the end of year. So yeah. Jordan and Bird and yep. Magic Johnson and yep. Barkley and yep. Ewing and all these yeah. guys were, were starting to co- get me. Could you sense the uh, a changing tide, I guess, a little bit in that time. Yes, I sure could. You know, I played in the old and my first a, a, ABA All Star game. I played with, with guys, and I had a good game, and we, we we beat the the rest of the ABA All Stars. And then I played in some other games and did okay. But then my last ABA, my last NBA All Star game, was in I think eighty one or eighty two. And I remember going out there, and everybody that I played out there, they were so much bigger and stronger than I was. I mean, they, these guys were just really strong guys. And it, it, I just recognize that for me in my career, you know, my career was based on defense, speed, and, and getting up and down the court. And, you know, I, I, would, I would consider myself at those times a predator. You know, I tried to go for the steal. I tried to block shots. And then I remember that last year I was more of a um, prey 
than the predator. <laughs> you know? And so it's sort of you sort of sense that you know this is this is not a whole lot of fun. This is probably when I should bow out, which which I did. And I do also remember that my, right before my last year with Philly, my son, my oldest son Eric, was in first class, first grade, and he was in a spelling bee one night, and I missed it because we had a game, of course, and. Uh, he won the spelling bee. He spelled duck. <laughs> you know, I, but, spelling bee's gotten a little tougher that, that, since that's then. That's true. That's true. But you know, I missed that. I was I was disappointed. You know, I, that was important to me, and so I thought, you know, I don't want to miss a lot of these moments. So uh, I had I played twelve years, and I was you know was blessed with that and thankful for it. I don't know if you know this, but neither Jones nor I is in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do you find out that you're in the Hall of Fame? Well, I found that when I was driving to see my son down in South Carolina. On the, I was on the interstate. And was I, he in the spelling bee? Yes. No, <laughs> this is the middle one. No, this is the middle one. No. Uh, and I got a call from the president of the, um, of the, uh, the Hall of Fame and uh, said, hey, congratulations, you have been voted to be inducted this fall into the Naismith Hall of Fame. And I, I, I was just stunned. You know, and I, I, I thought back, at, you know, how many guys average 12 points a game in the NBA that makes the NBA – it makes the Hall of Fame. And, you know, back in the 60s, I think maybe a couple of guys from the Celtics might have done that, but they were really great players and won multiple championships. And, you know, I, I, in my acceptance, I, I did mention the fact that, you know, I wanted to thank those who acknowledged that being, being uh, impactful on this defensive end was just as important as on the offensive end. And I think most coaches recognized that um, uh, at that time uh, when I was playing. And I'm just, I'm thankful, you know, I, it was a long time after my playing career to be inducted, but uh, certainly an honor and a blessing and uh, something that I'll never forget and happy about that. Okay, this is the first time that I've ever sat and spoken with you at length, but you seem just like very low-key, very yeah. chill guy. Yeah. Does anything ever get your heart rate up? <laughs> Do you ever get fired up about uh, anything? Not, well, let me think about that. Well, <laughs> if I ride my bike to my heart, or my heart will start beating too fast. Uh, you know, I, you know, if I watch a Carolina game, you know, I'm, I, and then in the end, I'll get nervous about it, you know, um, uh, or watch the Sixers. I'll get, you know, it'll, it'll, I want them to do well, both those teams. And, uh, but no, I don't really get too upset about things. I've, I've really, you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed the game of basketball. It's been great for me and my family. Um, but again, when it, at the bottom line, it's, it's a game and uh, it's to be enjoyed and uh, not to be, uh, you know, it's not life or death. You've had a life in basketball, but as you just said, it doesn't it doesn't feel like you define yourself as a basketball player. How how do you define yourself? Uh, I, well, I was I would I would define myself as a Christian, just you know somebody who wants to honor God through his life, try to do the right thing, um, try to help other people, encourage other people. You know, I, when I retired from the um, NBA, I, I, my kids went to Charlotte Christian School, became the coach there. Steph Curry came through that school, and Seth Curry and. Anthony Gill, there's several NBA players got to go through there. And so to, to have an impact in their lives spiritually was important to me. And just to, uh, to leave a legacy of something that's not just temporal, but is eternal. So, you know, my faith in Christ is something that uh, I do carry with me. I'm, I'm certainly not ashamed of it. I'm very thankful for it. And I know where I'm going when, when this, uh, this 72-year-old body quits ticking, uh, I'll move on. How did that become important to you? Uh, in college, uh, my I was at North Carolina. In fact, Dean Coach Smith gave me a book on Christianity. I had gone to church most of my life, but I wasn't I wasn't a believer. Um, then I met a girl named Tess, who's now my wife, um, and she's with me here. Um, and she was witnessing to me, sharing to me about Jesus, how he lives in her heart. And I'm thinking, this guy died 2,000 years ago. How does he live in her heart? <laughs> and I, but she was so pretty, I wanted to keep dating her. So I, I just said, okay. <laughs> Savvy you know, move. That's right. <laughs> you know, whatever you say, that's great. So, you know, I th we dated for about a year and a half. And uh, we finally just, uh, the fall of my senior year, her dad was a lawyer. And he wouldn't let us. He said, you're not going to marry my daughter until you get your degree. So I was a year away. And I said to a test one night, I said, hey, listen, why don't we get engaged for a year and then we'll get married the next spring when I graduate. And she said something to me that really impacted me. She said, Bobby, I don't think I can marry somebody if I don't know that they're a committed Christian. It really embarrassed me. I, th you know, I thought, well, I've gone to church. I'm a good guy. You know, I, I do, the, do the good things. And, uh, but I, I had been with her enough to understand that the Bible is very clear. It says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And so that night I just asked the Lord to come into my life. My, my idea of a Christian at the time was 
kind of a kind of a weak person, you know, kind of a wallflower, missionary type. I didn't want to be a missionary. I wanted to play in the NBA. And my, my success with the Olympic team had allowed me to at least think that I possibly could do that. And so that night I just, I, I, again, I asked the Lord to come to my life. He did. He changed my perspective. I'd always taken for granted that I'd come to this school on my own. Well, I recognized that God gave me certain, had given me certain abilities, and my parents had raised me in a certain way, and, I'm, and I, I got some of the greatest coaches ever to, to train me how to play. So, um, you know, I, I'll share this other story with you. I don't know if you have time or not, but uh, my freshman <laughs> year— all the time okay, you need. <laughs> my freshman year, I experienced something that happened to me that was embarrassing to me. I, uh, as a freshman at, at Granville Towers, Coach Guthridge would come up every night to make sure we, were, we had a study hall from like 8 to 9 or whatever. And so we would, we, you know, when we always know when he was on the hall because he always did the same thing. He always went to the far end and went there, knocked on everybody's door and just stayed two or three minutes. So he, he came, we got to work. He's on the hall. So I was in bed. I hopped up and got my book out to look like I was studying, which I wasn't. <laughs> and, and so he finally comes to my room and he said, Bobby, how's it going? I said, good, coach. I'm studying. He looked at me and said, well, great, Bobby. Keep it up. I'll see you tomorrow. I said, yes, sir. So I, as I said that, I looked at my book, and my book was upside down. <laughs> you know, I, but he didn't notice it. And so I, I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. He, he, didn't, he didn't see it. So, I, was so in, I, was, I wanted to impress my teammates so much that I went through the bathroom to the next room, which I think I had assumed he had already been to, and said to my, my two other freshman uh, teammates, hey, you wouldn't believe Coach Guthrie thought I was studying. My book was upside down. And he, I, I totally fooled him. And as I'm talking to him, they're looking past me at the open door, and there's Coach Guthrie hearing everything that I said. And I, I, I was just, you know, it was a foolish thing that I did. And I turned back to him, and he looked at me and said, Bobby, can I speak to you in the next room for a second? And I said, yes, sir. So I, I walked through the bathroom. And it, it seemed like it was like a mile walk. You know, it was like 10 feet or some, five feet. And he closed the door and he said this. He said, Bobby, he said, listen, we're going to be together for the next four years. Why don't we forget this ever happened? And I was stunned. I, you know, I, I just thought, well, I'm going to be running stadium steps or I'm going to be, you know, doing something you know, for punishment. And that was the first experience I ever had with grace. And grace is unmerited, unmerited favor. I didn't, des- I didn't deserve that. He gave it to me. And that really, as, as I became a Christian, I came to understand what grace is. It's something that we don't deserve, but God gave it to us through his son Jesus, you know, by his atoning death on the cross. So, um, you know, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. So he gives us grace and he gives us faith to believe that. Um, so, I, you know, Coach Guthridge and Coach Smith both impacted my life to a degree that uh, I'll never forget. And, uh, you know, just is, is certainly so special to me. It's it, just in hearing your stories that I mean, Dean Smith, Dr. J, yeah. Steph Curry, like you, you've yeah. had, you've had these connections to yeah. all these just incredibly yeah. important people in this game. And, and I mean, it, do you ever just sit back and go, this is wild that this has happened? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I don't think that I think that God has a plan for all of us and, you know, has a plan for each one of you two guys. And, and myself. And so, you know, there's a path we follow. Sometimes we go off that path and do what we want to do. And, you know, fortunately, he'll, he'll get us back on the right path. But uh, I, I'm thankful that I got to be around those guys and have hopefully have an influence on them. Um, and it's been a blessing. I, I, another example is Cody Zeller. Cody was with a rookie about 10 years ago with the Hornets and uh, a guy from Athletes in Action said, hey, why don't you reach out to him? And he doesn't know anybody in the city. So he became like another son to it. He came over to eat three or four, maybe five times a month, and uh, still friends, know his, his family, his parents, Tyler, um, just wonderful family and just a, an, another blessing. So, you know, it's just been a, um, a life of, you know, I like basketball. I love basketball, but I, I'm, not, I'm not do or die for basketball. I can, I can walk away from a loss or a win and just move on, you know, think about something else. Like, I remember with the Sixers, whenever we would lose a game, we'd have to cross the Walt Whitman Bridge, go back to New Jersey. And my wife and I, we'd talk about the game for about three or four minutes. Um, and I'd say, well, you know, you got to have a gimmick. They had one. We didn't. You know, they played better than we did. So, you know, or I, I played poorly or whatever it is. And then after about three or four minutes, we were thinking, hey, we're on top of the bridge. We can get WBT radio. Let's, well, let's listen to a Charlotte radio station from up here in Philly. So uh, we, we'd move on. <laughs> What's the biggest challenge that 
you feel like maybe you and Tess have faced that it makes it tough to be married for 50 years? Uh, I don't, you know, I think, Adam, communication is, is one. Uh, for, for me, I'm a very quiet person. My wife is a very uh, outgoing, social, kind person. Um, and so, you know, we, we, like this weekend, this is something she loves to do. You know, uh, for me to go out and, and do something like this, it's, I love it because it's North Carolina. If it was Philadelphia Sixers, yeah, you know, I, I, I would do it, but it wouldn't really. But um, so that's really the, the hardest thing. You know, and, you know, we have eight grandchildren now. We have three kids, and they're all happily married. Our, our kids are. And I think that one of the toughest things is to try to impart what you f- believe onto your children and grandchildren. And, you know, you just can't say you got to live it. And so that's that was really you know that's the challenge just to to walk the walk. Don't just don't just say you're going to do something. You know, actually do it and do it the right way. Well, we could do this forever. This has been <laughs> awesome. Um, let's at least last one for me. Just when you've mentioned multiple times Carolina and the importance of Coach Smith and, yeah. and Carolina basketball. When if can you sum that up for us? What it's meant to you to to be a part of this program? Well, <laughs> it's hard to. Uh, you know, it's really. It was a turning point in my life. I, I, as I, I was recruited in the southeast area, not not heavily by you know a lot of big schools, but you know Duke, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Florida were the main schools. Uh, and but the decision that I made, you know, for Christ, is 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 the greatest. But going to Carolina was probably number two or three. I know my wife probably be before that, but North Carolina, you know, it's just. Um, they know how to do it. They, they know what they're doing here. And so that's uh, that was really, if I had not, as I said it earlier, if I had not gone here, I'd, I'd have been a decent player, but I would not have been a player that, I, that would be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I, I know that for a fact. 